Hello, my name is Justin Sterling. I'm an attorney and the founder of the Sterling Firm. Today we are discussing the overview of personal injury damages. The purpose of personal injury damages. In a civil lawsuit for personal injury, there are three main areas of concern. One, proving defendant's liability. Two, proving the amount of damages incurred by plaintiff. And three, the ability to collect those damages from the liable defendant. Once defendant's liability has been established or admitted, the plaintiff must prove the proper amount of damages to be awarded. The plaintiff will then be awarded financial compensation or damages from the at-fault defendant. Damages are the amount of money that will compensate the plaintiff for all the detriment proximately caused by the wrongful or negligent act of the defendant. In personal injury cases, compensatory damages are awarded to compensate the injured person for his or her actual loss. Damages in a personal injury case are intended to make the plaintiff whole. Realistically, it is impossible to make the injured plaintiff whole because it simply is too difficult to put a dollar amount on symptoms such as pain and suffering. The main overall objective is to best put the injured plaintiff back to the position he or she would have been had the injury not occurred. There are no set rules in assessing personal injury damages. There are no set rules to place a value on a serious bodily injury or the loss of a body part. Simply put, there is no amount of money that will ever truly adequately compensate the injured party. It is virtually impossible to restore or replace a body part. Therefore, the law attempts to provide compensation for the loss by awarding the plaintiff monetary consideration. In fact, the amount of compensatory damages awarded to a plaintiff is at the discretion of the judge or jury and is determined based upon the evidence and corroborative proof presented during the trial. In assessing the damages to which the plaintiff is entitled in a personal injury action, the jury must consider all the elements of damage revealed by the evidence, including but not limited to age and sex of the plaintiff, the physical condition of the plaintiff before and after the injury, the severity and duration of the injury, the mental suffering caused by the injury, plaintiff's loss of earning capacity, and the reasonable life expectancy of the plaintiff. Each case is based on its own facts and circumstances. However, the appellate court may consider the average award allowed for a particular injury in the past as determined by past jury verdicts when evaluating on appeal whether an award of damages is appropriate or excessive. Categories of personal injury compensatory damages, special and general damages. Compensatory damages, also known as actual damages, consist of two different categories. One, economic damages, special damages, and two, non-economic damages, known as general damages, special damages. Special damages consist of all economic out-of-pocket losses as a result of the injury, which can be proved by objective, verifiable documentary evidence such as medical bills, receipts, canceled checks, and business and wage records. Special damages are those that have a financial, economic, monetary value, such as medical bills and expenses, loss of income, loss of use of property, cost of repair or replacement, and costs of services. The term economic damages in the context of personal injury damages means money actually lost, debts actually incurred, or those debts which will be incurred for things such as medical expenses, loss of wages, or employment opportunities. Sometimes this is referred to casually as out-of-pocket damages. General damages. General damages are those that are intangible and do not have a monetary value such as subjective pain and suffering, mental anguish, consequential emotional distress, loss of consortium, the loss of domestic marital relations, and injury to reputation. These are oftentimes referred to as quality of life damages. General damages naturally flow from the injury and cannot be quantified by bills or receipts. General damages are presumed to exist if special damages are shown. However, special damages are not a prerequisite to recover general damages. The types of recoverable compensatory damages in personal injury cases. 
In a personal injury case, a plaintiff can recover compensation for physical, financial, emotional, mental, or psychological harm caused by another's negligence or intentional wrongdoing. This includes past and future pain and suffering, mental anguish, loss of wages, and medical expenses. However, the types of recoverable damages vary depending on the nature of the accident and the extent of the injury to the victim. Potential damages are evaluated on an ongoing basis throughout the case, as injuries which appear to be minor, such as soft tissue, often develop into a major long-term physical detriment, such as a herniated disc. In general, personal injury damages may include medical bills, lost wages and income, pain and suffering, emotional distress, loss of companionship, and punitive damage, medical bills. The plaintiff can recover the cost of medical bills arising from the injuries caused by the defendant. This includes the cost of medical testing or treatment or medical care of any type, such as hospital stays, nursing home stays, or physical therapy. The medical cost can be significant, particularly in cases involving permanent disabilities, which require adaptive devices or lifelong nursing care and medical support. The plaintiff must gather all information regarding the amount paid or costs incurred for all the medical services. It is important to include every expense that the plaintiff has incurred in the course of receiving treatment. This includes medicines and medical attendance, ambulance charges, laboratory fees, prosthetics, hospital services, therapy, nursing care, and cosmetic surgery to correct disfigurement. Travel expenses for the purpose of effecting a cure or to consult with an expert may also be recoverable. The recoverable cost of medical bills should also take into consideration the future costs that the plaintiff will likely incur. To note, the plaintiff may be required to turn over a portion, or in some cases, all of this money to their health insurer if the health insurer has been paying the bills prior to a settlement or damage award. In some cases, the health insurer or the health care provider will place a medical lien for payment on the damage award. Lost income and wages. The plaintiff can recover compensation for lost wages or lost income. If the plaintiff was forced to miss work because of the injury or treatment for the injury, then the plaintiff can recover for the loss of pay that resulted, regardless of whether the plaintiff was able to take vacation days or sick time. Plaintiff will need to present evidence supporting their loss of pay, such as testimony from their employer or comparable income statements before and after suffering the injury. If the plaintiff is permanently unable to work or is disabled due to the injury, then the loss of earning capacity may be recoverable by the plaintiff. Expert testimony from a vocational rehabilitation specialist is supportive evidence of the plaintiff's loss of earning capacity. The vocational rehabilitation specialist will assess plaintiff's medical limitations, conduct vocation testing such as intelligence and dexterity testing, and evaluate the various job requirements to predict the highest paying job available to the plaintiff as compared to the expected pay of the plaintiff if he or she had not been disabled. Pain and suffering. The plaintiff is entitled to recover compensation for the general damages of pain and suffering that was endured as a result of suffering and an injury. The amount of compensation for pain and suffering is determined by various factors. Evidence supporting pain and suffering include plaintiff's own testimony, demonstrative evidence such as photos and video recordings of plaintiff's condition, medical testimony from experts, medical records, and testimony from witnesses. The pain multiplier. Compensation for pain and suffering may be calculated based on a multiple of the special damages, which consists of the actual financial loss evidenced by the plaintiff's medical bills and lost wages. There is no set multiplier, and oftentimes it ranges from two, three, or even 10 times the special damages. It is arguable that the continued pain and suffering that the plaintiff will face for the rest of their life is worth at least 10 times as much as the medical bills. The rationale is that the higher the amount of medical bills, the more pain and suffering the plaintiff will endure. The tendency of juries to award large damages for pain and suffering, especially for significant injuries, often persuade insurance companies to settle the case. Insurance companies will often employ 
a pain multiplier, usually between one and a half and five. Emotional distress. Sometimes an extremely traumatic accident or injury may cause the plaintiff to experience emotional distress, which may present as mental anguish, depression, fright, apprehension, anxiety, nervousness, grief, indignity, humiliation, embarrassment, and physical pain. Damages for emotional distress are usually only recoverable when there is an objective way to provide proof. Emotional distress is usually evidenced by psychiatric records and the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Loss of companionship. Loss of consortium is an independent cause of action that belongs to the spouse or registered domestic partner of the injured victim. Loss of consortium allows for recovery for the loss of love, companionship, comfort, care, assistance, affection, enjoyment of sexual relations, and the ability to have children as a result of the injury to the victim. Loss of consortium is proved by the nature of the injury and by testimony of the spouses and other witnesses to the changes in the couple's activities before and after the injury. Generally, a loss of consortium claim is only worthwhile where the injury was severe. Punitive damages in personal injury cases. Punitive damages are never allowed in a simple personal injury negligence case. Punitive damages are only recoverable when the plaintiff has been harmed by egregious or reckless conduct. The purpose of punitive damages is to punish the defendant for the particular egregious wrongful behavior and to deter similar conduct. Punitive damages are awarded in addition to compensatory damages. California Civil Code Section 3294 states, in an action for the breach of an obligation not arising from contract, where it is proven by clear and convincing evidence that the defendant has been guilty of oppression, fraud, or malice, the plaintiff, in addition to the actual damages, may recover for the sake of example and by way of punishing the defendant. Oppression is defined as despicable conduct that subjects a person to cruel and unjust hardship in conscious disregard of that person's rights. Fraud means intentional misrepresentation or deceit. Malice is defined as conduct which is intended by the defendant to cause injury to the plaintiff or that shows a willful and conscious disregard of the rights or safety of others. Punitive damages must be proved by a higher standard of proof than normal personal injury damages. That is, punitive damages must be proved by clear and convincing evidence for example, by 75%, as opposed to by a preponderance of the evidence, such as 51%. Punitive damages may be awarded in a personal injury case involving one, car accident claims, where it is proven that the at-fault party was driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs at the time of the accident, or two, intentional torts, such as assault and battery, including sexual assault and abuse claims. Limitations on the amount of recoverable compensatory damages in personal injury cases. Compensatory damages allow recovery for actual harm suffered by the plaintiff. That is, the amount of recoverable damages are limited to those that are reasonably certain and definite. Only reasonable medical expenses are recoverable in personal injury cases. The amount of medical expenses must be reasonable. Often, the amount of medical expenses can be stipulated by the parties. However, when the defendant challenges the amount of medical expenses on the grounds that they were unreasonable, such expenses must seriously be out of line when compared to the severity of the injury. Medical experts will be required to testify as to reasonableness of the medical costs and services rendered to plaintiff. Moreover, reasonableness is the only limit on the amount of pain and suffering damages. Evidence is required to prove future pain and suffering in personal injury cases. Plaintiff is not limited to recovery of damages up to the time of settlement or trial. However, lump sum prospective damages must be discounted to present cash value. Moreover, damages that are purely speculative are not recoverable. For a victim of negligence to recover damages for possible future consequences, an experienced personal injury attorney will demonstrate to a reasonable certainty that a future consequences will result from the original injury. 
while evidence of substantial personal injuries or permanent injuries may of itself be sufficient to show future pain and suffering, in some instances, an experienced personal injury attorney will submit proof of the following facts and circumstances, which establish that the plaintiff is suffering from continuous pain, complaints of pain, tenderness and soreness, itching, swelling, bleeding, bruising and hematoma, muscle spasms, high pulse, high blood pressure, tears, perspiration, dilated pupils, moaning and trembling, wincing or other distorted facial expressions, abnormal reflexes, types of injury ordinarily accompanied by pain, laboratory tests consistent with painful symptoms, and cessation of complaints of pain and receiving analgesic painkiller drugs. Moreover, future medical costs can also include those from medical complications that are likely to arise in later years. California Pure Comparative Negligence Rule. The defendant may argue that the plaintiff caused or contributed to the incident which caused the injury. California applies the pure comparative negligence rule in personal injury cases, except for intentional torts. In doing so, the amount of recoverable compensation will be reduced by an amount that is equal to plaintiff's percentage of fault for the accident. Defendant bears the burden to apportion fault. Non-economic damages liability can be apportioned only to the extent that defendant pleads by affirmative defense and proves the comparative fault of others and then proposes a special verdict at trial requesting allocation. Assumption of risk in cases where by virtue of the nature of the activity, no legal duty exists on the part of the defendant to comply with a particular standard of care to avoid an inherent risk of harm to plaintiff, then plaintiff is completely barred from recovery. Such cases often involve sport activities. The only general legal duty owed between co-participants involved in a sport activity is to avoid intentionally injuring one another or to avoid engaging in such reckless behavior that is considered completely outside the scope of conduct ordinarily involved in the sport. California Proposition 213 bars uninsured motorists from recovering general damages. In 1996, California voters passed Proposition 213, which was aimed at making more California drivers get insurance. Pursuant to California Civil Code Section 3333.4A2, uninsured motorists are barred from recovering non-economic damages in personal injury cases, even if the other driver is completely at fault for the accident. As a result, the uninsured plaintiff may not recover damages for pain and suffering, which is typically the largest category of non-economic compensation, disfigurement, physical impairment, and inconvenience. One key exception to this rule, pursuant to California Civil Code Section 3333.4, the uninsured driver may recover non-economic damages if the accident was caused by a driver who was operating a vehicle while under the influence of drugs or alcohol, and that driver is in fact convicted of DUI in connection with the accident. General damages are capped in medical malpractice cases. In some cases, damages are even limited by statute. Pursuant to the California Medical Injury Compensation Reform Act, MICRA, codified by California Civil Code Section 3333.2, a $250,000 cap is placed on general non-economic damages in medical malpractice cases. Plaintiff has the duty to mitigate damages. The defendant may present evidence that reasonable medical treatment would have alleviated plaintiff's pain and suffering and therefore reduce or defeat the amount of damages recoverable. However, the plaintiff is not required to undertake unreasonable risks or undergo dangerous treatment. The issue of reasonableness is a question of fact for the determination of the jury. The Howe Doctrine in California Personal Injury Cases. In 2011, the California Supreme Court decided the case Howe v. Hamilton Meets and Provisions, Inc. and held that an injured plaintiff whose medical expenses are paid through private insurance may recover as economic special damages no more than the amounts paid by the plaintiff or by the insurer for the medical services received or still owing at the time of trial. The how doctrine has drastically reduced the value of personal injury cases. The plaintiff cannot recover the negotiated rate differential. 
the plaintiff can only recover from the defendant the contractually adjusted amount that was actually paid, which is significantly less than the actual bill amount. The injured plaintiff cannot recover the negotiated rate differential, which is the difference between the full amount billed and the actual amount paid. Pursuant to the Howe Doctrine, the defendant will be permitted to introduce at trial the payment records of the actually paid medical expenses to support the argument that plaintiff's reasonable medical costs are less than what was actually billed. The fact that the payments were made in whole or in part by plaintiff's insurer is still inadmissible pursuant to the collateral source rule of evidence. The full amount billed is not relevant to general damages. Moreover, in 2013, the California Court of Appeals Second Appellate District decided the case Korenbaum v. Lampkin and held that evidence of the full amount billed for plaintiff's medical care was not relevant evidence to support plaintiff's future medical care or non-economic pain and suffering general damages. Evidence of the full amount billed, when otherwise inadmissible, is not admissible as a tool to allow a plaintiff's attorney to argue before a jury on the amount of non-economic damages that should be awarded. In addition, an expert providing testimony on the reasonable value of future medical services similarly cannot use the full amount billed for past services as a basis for that opinion on future expenses. The reasonable value of services is admissible to prove the extent of plaintiff's injury. But even if the healthcare provider has agreed to accept the compromise amount as payment in full for the services provided, evidence of the reasonable value of those services may be admitted at trial to provide a more complete picture of the extent of the injuries. If such evidence is admitted, it is the responsibility of the defendant to ensure that the jury's verdict specifies what damages, if any, are being awarded for past medical services. This specification will make it possible for the court on proper motion to reduce the jury's award for past medical expenses to the amount that was actually paid for the health care services. California appellate courts are presently split on whether to admit the fully billed amount and take a reduction post-verdict or to only present the adjusted number to the jury. If a jury hears evidence of the amount accepted as payment in full for the services provided by medical providers, but nonetheless awards a greater sum as compensation for past medical expenses, the defendant may move for a new trial on the grounds of excessive damages. If such a motion is granted, however, the court may allow the plaintiff to elect to accept a reduced damages award rather than undertake a new trial. Income tax treatment of personal injury damages recovery. Compensatory damages, awards, and settlement for personal injuries are not taxable and are not subject to state or federal income tax. This includes all damages recovered in an action arising from physical injury or sickness, except for punitive damages. Moreover, the recipient of the damages does not have to be the injured victim. Therefore, recovery for wrongful death and loss of consortium are also not taxable.